out there on the table. dot com slash uh, donate. I almost went backwards. If you have your Bible, uh, open up to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I almost said slash give, and that's what it used to be, but it's now com slash donate. So, because we appreciate every, every, uh, every time that you give, we do. This morning, you know, we've been talking about obviously improving our families, right? And about improving our human relationships with with just other people. I've been challenging you, obviously, to to do a little bit of home improvement. Obviously, we're not talking about you redoing the floors in your house. We're not asking you to put up a new wall, tear down a wall, you know, add another, you know. We're not adding to your honey-do list, all right? We're not doing any of that. But I've been challenging you, obviously, the thing that I've been challenging you to do is something that is more challenging than that. It's more difficult than that. It's... It's more uh, difficult than all those home improvement projects. I've been asking you to work on uh, your, your family, your home, and to bring it in line with God's word and with God's will, right? And, you know, this morning, uh, we're going to continue looking at our homes. We're, we're going to uh, continue to do that as well uh, this morning. But in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse, starting at verse 21, Ephesians chapter 20, uh, 25, verse 21, and we're going to go through uh, to, through. Wives, submit yourselves unto your, uh, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is, uh, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is uh, the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be uh, to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may uh, he sanctify and cleanse it wash of water by the word that he might uh, present it uh, present, present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives and their own body as their own bodies he that loveth his wife uh, loveth himself for no man ever uh, ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth nourishes and cherishes it even as the lord the church for we are for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones. for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh this is a great mystery but i i speak concerning christ and the church nevertheless I, uh, let everyone every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife that she referenced her husband. Chapter 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Verse 4, and ye father, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you uh, that your word always speaks to us. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would fall upon the fertile soil, that you would give us ears to hear it, that we not be, and that we would not just hear it, but we would also do it. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning, that it would be as a fire shut up in my bones. Amen. Now, like I said, as we've been going through this, and it's been an interesting study of, of what we find in the Scripture regarding what God expects the, a family. When you, uh, when we have looked at this, uh, when we've looked into this study, you will find that man in the family is the key to making it work, making it all work the way God intended it to work. The, you know, God has put man in that primary responsibility for having a God biblical family. That, uh, that may be why uh, men, husbands, and fathers have been under such severe attack in American culture. Very often in media, the husband and the father is portrayed as some kind of bumbling, stumbling fool. We see this all the time on different shows. I mean, one of the ones I first you know, started you know, remembering as a kid, I used to watch The Simpsons. Homer is the epitome of this. If you ever watched you know, uh, The Simpsons, he's the bumbling idiot you know, on the show, and he's like, 
He knows that he knows absolutely nothing. This sermon is not that. This sermon is to encourage dads to be dads, to encourage men to be men. This morning, you know, I'm not going to sit here and start ripping on dads and, you know, and the father of this home. Because the thing is, is that I think, you know, we see enough of that. We are aware that, you know, men are, you know, obviously the men, are, they go through all kinds of pressures in our society. Men have tremendous job pressures today. The economy is tight, and there is more pressure than ever upon men to provide for those that they love. Men face tremendous temptations in our society. There is the temptation of pornography. There's the temptation of alcohol. There's the temptation to cut, uh, to cut corners to make more money. All these pressures and many more are against men. And then you have the feminist movement. The feminist movement puts pressure on men. Dr. Paige Patterson said that one of the greatest problems in American life today is the feminization of men. This is... Uh, there is an effort by some to try to make men like women. Do you think that's true? I was just noticing, you know, this. I was, talk- I was talking to my wife. I said, you ever watch, you know, like a show, like especially at like the older shows, like say Andy Griffith. It's a show I watch. Or like I Love Lucy. By, you know, no matter how they looked, their build and everything else, and now... You're lucky sometimes, you know, ladies, if you go out and you're like, I want a man, but I can't get him away from the PS5. Oh, it got quiet. Must have touched on something there. The feminist movement tried to sell America on the idea that there is no difference between man and woman. That women are the same as men, right? That they can do the same things, right? But the stubborn facts of biology kind of refuse to go away in that area, don't it? We know, obviously, that men, for the most part, are stronger than women, right? Women are more delicate, right? You know, there will be some other, like, I could do anything a man can do. I'm not saying that you can, you can, whatever, but that's how God has designed it, right? Time, and this is, a, a, I, I have on here a few years ago, but this is probably more than that. Time Magazine, a few years ago, had a featured article on the difference between man, men and women. It discussed why men and women are different. Do you know what the results were? Because they were born that way. A lot different than nowadays. They say, oh, well, we're not really sure. We can't really figure out what a man or a woman is. I mean, you know, okay. You know, like, you know, one of the new Supreme Court justices, they asked, you know, what's a woman? I can't answer that. They couldn't answer it. And they said, you're hired. You're a good Supreme Court justice right then and there because of the fact that they could not define it and they wouldn't define it. Men and women obviously are different. I mean, we could see that on the playgrounds when we were kids, right? We can see that on the playgrounds now. Boys, you know, obviously boys and girls are different. Boys choose sides for their games based on ability, right? You play football, you usually, the last person picked is the one that likes to, you know, is the person that when they see a whole bunch of people coming towards them in football, they throw the ball up in the air because they don't want to get hit. That's usually the last person picked, Right? Well, you know, and then, you know, girls, they choose sides based on relationships. They'll sit over there as long as you're, you know, you're in good standing with the other ones. And, so, you know, and sometimes if you're not, you're like, no, you're, you know, you, you told, you know, so-and-so about whatever. And then, you know, girls are all on that. So, obviously, when, when, and the other part of it is that when boys play and somebody gets hurt, especially in football, they usually drag them off the field so they don't interrupt the game. Right? That's how it was when I was a kid. I mean, I shared the story before that I was playing dodgeball, got hit in the face, it kind of hurt, and, and the, and the uh, gym teacher was like, okay, just go walk it off. Said, All right. But there's other times where I played, fo- you know, played football. We called, you know, played tackle football, and you know, we called it a name. My wife said that I'm not allowed to say that name, but you know, it was, I'm going to say it anyways. Okay. I'm up north, so maybe this is the only area that it was called this. It was called Smear the Queer, all right? Basically, the whole entire thing was is that basically you had the ball, 
you ran, and if you got a touchdown. If you got tackled, okay, you popped it up, somebody else would run, they try to get a touchdown. That's, that's the whole entire, it wasn't real football, it was just the fact of, and you know, the thing is that we're kids, we had, that's what we were told it was called. It wasn't like the fact that I was like, oh, I'm going to go out there and, you know, whatever. But that's what it was called. But, you know, girls oftentimes, if they get a boo-boo, they all gather together and support her. They usually all get together, and yes, I'm making generalizations here. This is not like always true, okay? But obviously, men and women are just different. So I, this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about the role of a man in the family. Now, obviously, you know, next week, I'll talk about, you know, the ladies. I'll talk about them. That sounds a little bad. We'll discuss the ladies. There we go. We'll discuss, eh, Whatever. Just come next week, okay? I told my wife, I said that, you know, like, when you look, like, for sermon titles or anything else, there's some, like, really funny ones. Like, one of them was, is uh, putting women in their place. And I was like, I'm sure. I'll tell you on this very simple title of Be a Man. Be a Man. And I've been, you know, encouraged, obviously, in recent years, is that as this whole that we've seen over the past several years has kind of, you know, taken a, you know, an attack on America and the responsibility of men, men have began to rise up. Men have said, no, this is not real. This is not the way it should be. I'm not talking about Neanderthal, man, that comes out there, grunts and scratches, and then tells a woman to go in the kitchen and make him a sandwich, all right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about ones that actually, you know, are following on a local basis. A, a lot of men in American cultures and American culture has never been taught how to be a man, though, right? They never had that role model. They've never had an example in their home. You know, they never had that example in their home. And we need some godly men who can help other men become the men they ought to be for the glory of God, right? Today, like I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to focus on, uh, I'm going to focus on, Families here, I, you know, and I don't want you. Uh, I don't want, you know, what I say to be discouraging, you know, to, to you or you know, or to the ladies or anything else. Because you're like, okay, well, he's talking about men. I don't have to listen. We all have to listen, right? We all should listen. And I don't want to see any, you know, women out there, or ladies, spouses, going, yeah, do that. Joseph, move over a little bit more. Because <laughs> she's trying to get you. All right. Trying to buy it because of, you know, but, you know, because, you know, here's the thing. If you're trying to bring up a family in a single family you know, situation and they will go or a single parent situation and they will go oh well obviously they just you know and they have no idea what happened the person could have left could have done you know what you know they just whatever it was but the bible gives us an encourage you know gives single parents an encouragement all right in psalm 68 verse 5 it says a father of you that god will help you and I'm not trying to say uh, anything that will make single parents you know, try, uh, feel bad today, but God's ideal for family is that there be a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. That's God's ideal. That's his ideal for the whole situation. And I'm going to use some verses of, of Scripture that are particularly directed towards the husband and the wife. That relationship to the entire relationship of a man responsibility to his wife can also be said about his responsibilities to his family. About what does a godly man and a, and a godly father do? What do they do? Number one is this, love your family. Love your family. Seems pretty plain and simple, doesn't it? And you don't, you don't say, you know, you may be saying, well, Pastor, I didn't have to come to church this morning to know that. I 
love your family. But I'm going to, I want to talk to you about what is involved in loving your family. There are some illustrations given to us in Ephesians chapter 5, which tell, you know, which tell a man how he is to love his family. Then verse 25, it says this, it says, Husbands, love your wives. Sounds pretty plain and simple, right? Verse 33 says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Then he illustrates it in verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loves the church. So he, he, tells us, he, he tells us all these times to love your wife, to love your wife, and then he, he explains it, even as Christ loved the church. So men, love your families like Jesus loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? The love of Jesus for his church was a selfless, sacrificial love, and that's how do we need to be as men. Jesus loved the church. He loved sinners. He loved you and me. So uh, you know, he loved you and me so very much that he was willing to sacrifice his very life on the cross of Calvary. Right? That's how much he loves us, and that's how much a man is supposed to love his family. You say, man, I don't know. That seems that seems pretty difficult, doesn't it? It's a sacrificial love. But I see that, you know, I see that, you know, that love, in, you know, in a lot of the fathers this morning and a lot of the men. The thing is, is that there's a reason why, you, you know, sometimes you go to work for 14, 15, 16 hours a day. You're trying to provide for your family, but you're not trying to buy their love by giving them things. Right? You know what you have to do in order to make ends meet. And there's nothing, you know, and I talk about this, there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. Just not from church for the whole year. There's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, going out of town for the weekend or the week or, or whatever. You know, uh, you know, a couple, you know, a couple weeks. Too many times, you know, uh, what ends up happening is, is that people say, well, I love. Every you know every single weekend every you know and they miss and we don't see them you know you know as soon as it gets sunny out we don't see them again until it snows and then you you know you, you just kind of bring it up you say so did you go to church on the Sundays that you were at the lake you know to show your kids to show your wife to show all of them. How much you love the Lord and you love them. Why? Because you want you, you wanted to go to the one that epitomizes love, which is Jesus Christ. He's the one that teaches us. He's the one who shows us. He is the one that you know uh, displays love throughout the Word of God. Amen. When they come to the altars, Lord, I'll do this if you do this. Lord, you know, if you do this, I, I can guarantee the part where you say if, whatever. The Lord always keeps his promises. You don't. I don't. I, I think about this. I had to break a promise to my daughter. I was supposed to take my daughter on a daddy-daughter date. I was supposed to... My daughter and you say well that's that, that's a little different it's still breaking a promise no matter which way you said it I, I told her I promised that she would you know that I would go God's God is always going to keep his it, it doesn't it's a hundred percent gonna happen but we can make promises and often, you know, and say, you know, we could even say 98% of the time we keep them, but that 2% is, is the time, you know, it, it makes us, you know, uh, to be, that we cannot say that we are keeping our promises. It's not a conditional love. It's, I will love you if, but it's a sacrificial love, right? Love is primarily a verb. Love is not just something you feel. 
Love is something you do. Love is a decision, right? Pray for your wife faster than for you, but for the husband. No. But the honeymoon stage wears off. And you, then at that point, it's, yes, you still love them, but the verb, you know, the fact is, is that you choose to love them at that point. It's no longer, oh, I love them because of the feelings. I love them because... to love your wife, you decide to love your children. You may not like it is a conscious decision, a sacrificial love. Because you know that sometimes your kids or your spouse are going to not make you happy, right? You may not like them at that moment, but you still, you make that decision. You say, I love that you have to have, you have to be like a dictator or a tyrant. You know, serve me. Do all of this for me, right? It commands men to love their families like Jesus loved his church. It is a sacrificing, it is a giving kind of love. Not only does the Bible say, uh, you know, not only does the Bible says that the man is to love his family like Jesus loved the church, but in verse 20, I don't like how it looks, but we love our bodies, right? We care to, to see, we take care of it. We make sure that our body is clothed. No man is. You know, the man is to uh, love the members of his family as he loves his own body. He is to nourish it. He is to cherish it. He is to take care of it. There, uh, there's. Uh, sorry, that's the way that God wants men to love His family. That's the illustration. Uh, illustration. Turn over to First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Now, there are uh, some applications of how a man is to love his family. First Peter chapter three, verse seven it says, "Likewise, ye, uh, ye husbands, dwell with them according uh, to knowledge." vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God. Now remember uh, that what uh, it says about husbands is that also about fathers and the members of the family, right? We are sending application. Likewise, ye husbands can be, and dads, dwell with them according to the knowledge giving honor to you unto the uh, to It says, dwell with them according to knowledge. That means... ...to understand the members of his family. Every member of your family is distinct. Every child is distinct. It requires special observation and special care. Right? Every single you know, one in your family is different. You say, you know what? Well, they came from you know me and my wife. They all I've seen this in my I've seen this in my daughter. That somehow or another she's different than me, but yet the same. I'm sorry, Lil. But I've also seen it in my brother and me. My brother and me are, are you know, some ways obviously the same, but in other ways we're, we're, we're opposites. You know, we've had the same upbringing, uh, upbringing but we are different. If you, have, uh, if you have a dozen children, I don't know of anyone in here that has a dozen children, you will have a dozen different personalities, though. And that's the amazing thing, that they have the same dad, the same mom, and yet they are different, they're as different as day and night. And you have to study, you have to study your wife, you have to study your kids and learn to dwell with them according to knowledge. What does that mean? 
That means, uh, you know, that means that you find out what they like to do. You don't necessarily try to get them to do what you want them to do all the time. And I say I put it all the time because there are some things that we find out, you know, with the, with our daughter that we we say, you know what, you should try this, and she says no, and she's like, I don't want to do this, and then we say, well, we're going to make you do it, and then she does it, and she goes, that was the best time ever. Not all the time that we say that to her, but the thing is, is that we know certain things that she's not like because we've studied her, we kind of know that, but we also don't force her into certain things, you know, uh, to be certain things that she's not. You also don't necessarily discipline uh, all your children the same way. One child, my dad corrected us the same way. We got, you know, we got. We got, you know, the belt. I never got a switch. Everybody always talks about switch. Another child, you could sit there and you could frown at that child, and that child will be. And I want to talk about, you know, you spanking them and everything. to get their attention, right? Kids are all different. There has to be some comprehension. I'll treat people that, you know, I'll treat people that come into my house I mean, it is. It's flat out stupid. I don't look Even as Christ, you know, loved the church, you know, I should obviously, you know, be treating her that way. Want to, and they'll still keep coming back. That's Should be some courtesy. There, there, there is to be uh, some courtesy. Also, it says, "Sense of grace in the family, where we understand that God has put us together." Remember, you didn't get to pick your family. No matter what happens, we are to be there for our family. We are to a member of the family is vitally important and deserves to be loved, nurtured, cared for, and honored. Men, we need to love our families, right? Number two is this: we also, men, we need to lead our families. We need to lead our families. You are the spiritual leader of the family. You are the the one who sets the pace in the family. What is involved in what is involved in a man being the leader of his family? Leadership rides on some other ships. Look at, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5. Go back to uh, uh, 5, verse 20, and then 22. It says, submitting yourselves one... Oh, sorry. No, that's 21. 20, uh, verse 20 says, giving thanks always uh, for all things unto God, and, unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands and as unto the Lord. Both of these verses speak of the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, this passage that has, this ha- passage has to do with family is written in the context of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And I want, to, uh, I want you to listen very carefully to this. You cannot exercise authority unless you are under authority. Does that make sense? You cannot, you cannot Exercise authority unless you are under authority. If you're not under the lordship of Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ is not the authority in your home, then your house is going to be utter chaos and turmoil. You say, well, pastor, I'm saved and I love the Lord, but my house is still that way. 
That's the reason why you're supposed to chasten the children. And you need to uh, show them those ways. But you cannot exercise that authority if you, uh, unless you are under authority, unless you are following that. If a man is going to exercise Lord, uh, leadership in his family, he must be under uh, the, biblical per, uh, the Bible principle of lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, the man, obviously, ha- oh, you know, the man has one of the hardest roles in the entire family. It is the man's responsibility to yield himself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Why do I say this is hard? Because men like being in, con- in control. A lot of times it comes easier for ladies because ladies are, you know, it's in their nature to submit. It's in their nature to be under authority. For the man, he wants to be in charge, and so for him, he has to, the harder thing for him to do is to yield himself to to Jesus Christ. But once we do that, everything comes into line. Everything comes in, uh, uh, you know, uh, comes into alignment. That's, uh, that's why that every man needs to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Everyone needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not only for his own sake, but also for the sake of his family. That's why every man needs to be totally dedicated to Jesus Christ as Lord of his life. You can't lead your family uh, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ unless you are under the, the Lordship of, of Jesus Christ. The second ship is partnership. Verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Family is a partnership between the husband and the wife. It is amazing to me that some men can lead major corporations all the time. Their dedication is more to, their, uh, the, to the business than it is to their own family. That's why families fail a lot of times. to their job. I'm with this family. And before you accept that promotion, I understand that, you know, they'll tempt you, say there's more money, you get a 401k, you get this health care and everything else. You may sit there and say, you know what, that's okay. Give it to the next man. All right? There's said about it, uh, uh, said about this situation. He said, the man is active, articulate, energetic, and really successful in his work. But he is inactive, inarticulate, home, or perhaps not so silently, retreat in affairs. The absentee father. Did you know that there are one million children born in America? Every year outside of But do you also know that means that there are with you for a moment and be really, really blunt with you. Sir, it takes more than your contribution of a sp- Wedlock, by the age of 13, there are 60% more, they're 60% more apt to be in crime, drugs, and illiteracy. They're going to be illiterate because of it. Marriage is a partnership. God wants children to have not only a mother, but, they also, but also a father who is committed to the partnership of making that marriage work. It is a partnership. The third ship is headship. Verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 5 says, For the husband is the head, uh, the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. It is, it is uh, it's not a dictatorship. A man is not... in his family. 
User are responsible to protect their family. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight says this. The faith and is worse than an infidel. Yes, you are to protect, but you know what? You need to be there as well. You know, God bless some of you parents. You provide for your families. You work and you bring in the necessary resources. You get in your cars. You deprive yourselves of needed rest and relaxation and bring how to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to carry on. Church is important. Make sure your family is in the pew when the uh, church time comes. Thank you. Thank you. You could be, you know, so many other places, you know, you could be in bed. Somebody say, oh, man. It's rough, but the thing is, is, you know, what you're doing is more important by showing up to church. You are the head of your family. That means you are the source of protection. You should, uh, never, you should never allow anything to come into your house that would entice your family to sin and fill them with the wrong kinds of things also. Don't bring anything in that would be unwholesome. Oftentimes, I bring this up because some people say, well, you know, kids have no problem with horror movies and all this other stuff. They did at one time. Kids had a problem with horror movies and all that you know, graphic stuff. The only reason why kids are uh, fine with it, you, know, you say now, is because of the fact that they've been shown it for so long that they've gotten used to it. But I, I know, you know that when, you know, I'll, you know sorry, Lily, I'm using you, you know, quite a lot in the sermon this morning, but I know that when my daughter sees something scary, she runs from it. She's terrified from it. Often, you know, and while maybe some of her friends are like, oh, that's cool. Did you see that? You see all the blood and guts that was and whatever? Kids, no child should ever see that stuff. No one should ever see that. You are responsible for where your kids go. Hear that, children? Your parents are responsible for where you go. So don't say, like, Dad, you're so mean. You never let me go anywhere. You never let me do anything. You are also responsible for what they do. If you don't believe me, your child does something dumb and stupid, the police will call you. You are, the resp- uh, you are responsible for the priorities in their life. And some of you are going, man, Pastor, you're just, weighing, you're just putting more on me right now. Be able to, you know, to bear that burden. But also remember... And development of your children is your responsibility, uh, your responsibility, dads. It's it's not. A Sunday school and preaching every Sunday, and I'm talking about Sunday morning, Sunday night. Have here at the church. I'm talking about taking advantage of every opportunity to help them learn about Jesus, and to grow in their relationship with Him. Oftentimes, people, uh, you know, there's, uh, I've met people, I was a youth pastor for quite a few years, and in youth ministry for a long time, uh, you know, time, and you would be surprised. And yet, the parents are not there to teach them the Bible, they expect it to come. Half hours, they should be good for the week. But yet they spend, what, six hours a day, six, seven hours a day in school. Against the Word of God. One thing would be science and evolution. From a monkey. He did not say you evolved from a squid or whatever new thing that they're saying you, you came from. For millions and millions of years, eventually, then something came. He then to man and gave him life. 
And then he took the rib out of the side of man and he made woman. God created you for a purpose. Amen? I'm sorry. There are people who say, well, that seems really ridiculous that God would take man and, you know, and he would create him. Yeah, and if you want to believe evolution, that something came out of nothing, or bang, and nothing happened? I mean, there was nothing. I mean, I watched this one video. It was this guy over again. He was trying to make a sound all amazing. He goes, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And then bang. How do you get something out of nothing? You can't get a bang out of nothing. There has to be a bang. Somebody has to, you know, somebody has to bang first. There has to be something that caused the bang. And I'm not going to say, well, God spoke and bang it happened because that's not true because God does not believe in, God doesn't believe in evolution. God's word believe, you know, shows us creation. You are not an animal like you know, some of your teachers want to teach you or the world wants to teach you. Like I said, the man is the head of the family. to get a little steel in your backbone and make a godly your family and lastly it's going uh, to be this lift your family you need to lift your family look at verses uh, 25 through 27 it says for husbands to love your wife uh, your own wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of Now watch this. It says that he might present it that it should be holy and without blemish. See how Christ lifts the church? Man, that's the way you are to lift your family. You are to help them grow in their gifts. You find out how God has gifted your family members and encourage them to develop those gifts. Be something that you're, you're accustomed to. But you should want your children to be all that God wants them to become, right? Uh, look at uh, chapter 6, verse 4 of Ephesians. It says, nurture. That means the education of the mind and morals. You are to, to, to help develop their mind and their morals of what's right and wrong, according to God's word. They are uh, trained in the ways of God, admonition or exhortation. They are led in the will of God. So for us, that we are to nurture, we are to uh, admonish, we are to exhort. In other words, we are to form, uh, you know, help with the education of their minds and their morals, but also lead them into the will of God. must help them become what he wants to be. If God wants them to be a Christian, then you help them. If he wants them to be, you know, if you want, uh, if he wants your, your daughter to be a homemaker, help her achieve that goal. Not everybody is made, you know, to go to college. Oftentimes, most people will sit there and say, you know what, I, I got to go to college to be a success. Oftentimes, what you find out when you're done with college if you're not going for a, like a higher education one, is you find yourself in a whole lot of debt. You know what? It's not a bad thing to learn trades. Work with your hands. Drive a truck. Ladies, it's not a bad thing to be a housewife. You're like, oh my goodness. He really was against the feminist movement. No, I'm against what's ever against the word of God. Whatever God has, you know, like I said, whatever God has planned for your sons and your daughters, that's exactly what you should want them to become. Help them to grow in grace. Help them to grow in their gifts. Help them to become 
the people God saved them to be and to fulfill the purpose for which they were created. The only time you, should, uh, you shouldn't encourage them to be what they want to be is when it goes directly against God's word. Don't be guilty of living you know, vicariously, and don't, yeah, don't be guilty of living vicariously through your children. I see that happen on the, on the ball field all the time. Whether it's the football field or the baseball field, and those are the only ones I kind of go to, sometimes go to soccer. But you have, you know, you have you know, someone out there, some dad thinking that, you know, that, that person. You know, I was going to be that way, but, you know, I ripped my shoulder. So my son, he's going to be, and the, and the son has no, he has no desire to be that. you wanted to do at one point help them to become what god designed them to be and help them grow in their walk with them that is the intent behind proverbs 22 6 that says train them up in a train up a child in the way that they should go and when he is old he will not depart from it that's one of the reasons why the bible also says you know fathers don't um oh, i'm forgetting the word not your children to wrath. Oftentimes that happens. Or we try to say, you know what, I know that God's called you to be a baker, but I want you to be a hazards and dangers there will be bad decisions and uh, you will get many things the hard fact is that fatherhood and God you don't ever graduate from the school of fatherhood or godly man uh, you know when you do get it right, isn't it? When all of a sudden your kids actually did listen when you thought that they weren't listening. And you're like, I have conquered. I have achieved. And then they tell you no, and you're like, well, it was a short achievement. All right. You just got to take, those, you know, the, the, take those, those things, you know, those accomplishments one at a time. If you become the kind of man and the kind of a good harvest in your children. You will uh, see than that. When your kids begin to do the things that you have taught to them and preached to them over and over again from, you know, from the Bible, it is not, there's no greater satisfaction than that. And you, who knows, maybe later on, when you're like, uh, maybe in your late teens or your early 20s, you may get a note from, uh, from your kid that says, Dad, I know that I tested you a lot. Dad, I want you to know that I did some things that you weren't happy with. I know that I gave you some difficulties, but Dad, I want you to know, as I look on, back on it now, I want to thank you for how you raised me. One of these days, you may get a child from, from, your, uh, from your daughter saying, Dad, I just want, uh, I want you to know that I thank you so much for being a real man in our family. I thanked my parents for disciplining me when I was in my early 20s. And they said, didn't you hate me when I did that? And I said, at the moment, yes. I said, but thank you for doing it. Why? Because if you didn't, I would be worse than what I am now. I'm not saying that you, you know, that you should never be friends with your children, but you are a parent first. You're 
I conclude with this. If faith doesn't work at home, it doesn't work, and it doesn't A sandu has, a sand dune has no shape or design to it. It just comes about. And we'll shape it, and the look of this. Uh, and Your family will, like I said, you. I think it all comes down to what kind. Now is the time to be obedient. Uh, and husbands need to get before the Lord and ask him to help you to be the like you should fix that today. Right? And love your families. have hindered him from leading the family. Ladies, if you... And I know that there are some in here saying, you know what, he never wants to. That's not being... You know, or have I taken... Ask God to forgive you for your rebellious attitude. You need to thank God that he has given you a good, godly family. And obviously, if you... You don't sit there and wait until tomorrow and sit there... When you change and when you allow God to do those things in your life, what's going to happen? Sometimes your family will use anybody and every. I'm not calling your family or your friends demon possessed, but. your boss use those things around you to say you haven't changed you know what he doesn't know what christ has done in you those speak to you you say you know i need to come up there and i need to pray for my family or wives if you want to come up and pray for your husbands or you know or, you know any of those situations or you need to be saved come forward Get up and you actually move to make that decision instead of sitting there saying, Get up out of your chair and you actually make that move. And why? Because then you know that the people around you. Well, that person just went down there. They must be serious about it. But also what it does is that if you go, I feel okay to go down. But over the next few moments, 